All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, today, uh, first and foremost, actually, we should say a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. Um, we are here in somewhat sunny Seattle on a Tuesday morning. Uh, my name is Jennifer. For those that uh, have joined us previously, welcome back. For those that it's your first time, uh, you're in for a special treat. This is a special webinar series that we offer once a quarter where we review uh, some product updates, where we've been and where we're going. So uh, we've got some great guests lined up for you today. Uh, joining us this morning are three very special members of our team that I'm going to ask to introduce themselves in just a moment. Harsh, if you'd like to say a hello and a few words about yourself. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Harsh. I work along with Praveen and Thierry on AppSheet. Uh, I'm mostly on the engineering side. I run this over on time. Um, uh, parts of the app sheet. Um, excited to be here and talk about what we're doing for this quarter. Excellent. And uh, Praveen, the man who needs almost no introduction, but I'm going to have you introduce yourself <laughs> nonetheless. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Praveen. Um, I've been working with app sheet for almost seven years. Excellent. And uh, last but certainly not least, Thierry. Thank you, Jennifer. So yes, I'm Thierry. Uh, I uh, run engineering for the client side, so I am Harsh's peer. Uh, uh, Harsh is way too humble. He's actually responsible for the super important all the backend infrastructure, and I'm mostly focused on the on the front end side. So both Harsh and I will alternate uh, on giving you some updates on uh, what we're working on together. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you, gentlemen, all for joining us today. Uh, for those that are participating in this session, uh, please feel free to ask questions either in your question box um, within your webinar platform, or uh, we highly encourage you to post on the uh, creator community thread that you'll see in your chat box as well. If there's any questions we're not able to address in session, we can certainly follow up with you on that particular thread after the session as well. So keep your questions coming as we move on, uh, as we proceed. We'll have three distinct pauses uh, for different sections in which, which we can address your questions as we move on. All right, uh, so without further ado, Thierry, uh, you are actually going to be hosting most of this today. So I'm going to turn it over for you if you wanna make any comments about this particular slide. Oh, so I get to do all the legal disclaimers. So this is a forward-looking <laughs> statement. We're going to be talking about a bunch of things that is in the future. Uh, mostly we're going to focus on Q4 today uh, because since we're going to do that every quarter, we we will reserve talking about you know Q1 and Q2 of next year. Uh, there's probably some stuff we're already working on for that, but we will reserve that for, for, for a future one. So we'll focus mostly today on Q4. However, still, uh, we're you know supposed to present that very long lengthy slide, which I will not read, <laughs> but that uh, mostly says nothing can no, none of the dates or statements or expectations should really be held against us if we don't deliver exactly as we said we would, uh, and that's pretty much what that states. So without further ado, let's start talking about the interesting midi stuff. So uh, I know we presented uh, the last time we we talked and we presented for those of you who were here. We were organizing everything around five uh, five uh, themes. Uh, and we kind of like internally still track to that, but uh, in the way we want to talk, we want to uh, publicly uh, about where we invest, uh, you know, now that we have a larger marketing and product management team, uh, they do stuff, you know, much, much better than we used to do it when it was just a couple of us. Uh, and so we've, we're organizing, you know, how we talk and, and present uh, around really this, the, the key personas, you know, the, the, the creator, the app creator, the consumer of the application, the users, and the person whose responsibility is to manage that ecosystem, not just manage the user, but manage the compliance of the application, the usage of the application. So we'll focus this presentation today around those three main users and, and use cases. And really the goal for us was to really increase the proficiency and the efficiency of those users. So making 10 times, you know, and that's really what we're trying to achieve, 10x more time, more intuitive for the app creator faster, more efficient for them to build those apps and, and to go faster to deliver that value to users, uh, make it 10, 10x times more, you know, more accessible for users or, you know, more reliable and compliant for, for people who are first job it is to manage that ecosystem. So uh, that, that's really what we're trying to thrive to. So uh, if, you, if you don't mind, uh, please move into one slide forward, please. So the other thing that we're gonna do is, I know you're gonna have probably tons of questions for us and we don't wanna queue all of those to the end and wait for the end. So what we're gonna do is run through a couple of slides uh, between Harsh and I on each of those uh, personas 
and then we'll stop at, at the end of each of those sections and welcome your questions and entertain your questions and you know Praveen being here as well we'll have a lot more richness uh, to give you answers to as well uh, and then we'll continue to the next section so that, that's kind of how we're going to do so let's focus first on the app creator and what we're doing in q4 time frame for that so please move forward one uh, one slide jennifer okay good so the first thing uh, about uh, you know our experience around you know no code app creation which is still you know very much the, the focus of what we worked on is um, a visual a visual refresh of the app editor uh, and for that, uh, you will, uh, for most of you who are on the free plan, you should already have seen it. We rolled that out last week. For those of you who are on the, uh, on the, on the paying plan, you're, there's about 25% of you who have been rolled out with the new UI already uh, yesterday, and you will get to 100% either by today or tomorrow. So this is like really imminent uh, that you're gonna have that new experience. It's a Google-like experience and using the same styles and fonts. Uh, uh, functionalities are exactly the same. Nothing has changed from functionalities. It's mostly just a visual refresh at that point. Uh, if you experience any changes in terms of behaviors, in terms of performance, of responsiveness, please by all means tell us uh, because that should not be the case. Uh, it should just actually make it clearer uh, in some ways. I know we've we've been using it uh, internally for at least a month and a half now, a couple of months, and I know I very much enjoy it. The second thing, which uh, is going to be rolled out fairly soon, probably in the next couple of weeks, is a new set of smart defaults. So as you know, uh, we provide some suggestions for creating views, for creating uh, various objects, you know, format rules and, and, uh, and other type of uh, objects. What we're doing now is when you create a new view, we're actually going to automatically accept the most likely suggestion based on the type of uh, view that you want to create and we'll automatically populate not just the name for it we'll populate the column binding for you we'll also select the most appropriate icon for you uh, and and hopefully we'll get all of those choices you know at least 80 percent right and really in doing so accelerate your efficiency in building the views that you want so uh, it should be rolling out in uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, and hopefully, you know, it should feel very transparent. It should just feel, oh, it just worked as, as expected. And you, know, you might even wonder how come it wasn't working like that before. So that's the, the second big update here. Now, one thing I'm really excited about too that I really hope we're going to be able to learn in beta in Q4 is actually revamping our chart authoring experience, which I know we've had a lot of feedback coming through the community about it. And it's not always very obvious, uh, very clear, even though the smart default that we have now in place is by default gonna give you a chart that actually makes sense to start with, not just an empty chart, but actually something that actually makes sense to, to, to get going. But I still wanted the uh, chart uh, building experience to be a lot more, uh, not just intuitive, but a lot more efficient in terms of getting you to a valuable insights right from the get go. So we've been working on a, on a, on a prototype of that, uh, which we had to pause for a sec to, to, to focus on what we're gonna talk in the next slides uh, in a second. But uh, I want to resume that work in Q4 and, and at least get us into a beta where we can start getting your feedback on that experience uh, before before Christmas. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we also said to do some work on building more uh, simplified, simplified expression authoring using natural language. And that's also something I'm hoping we'll be able to have in a beta form to start to get your feedback and where really the idea, and we're gonna start with, with expression, but eventually that's something we wanna do for any objects in AppSheet is for you to be able to express using words what you want that object to do or to, to be, and then for us to be able to interpret that from your words and kind of give you a, a, some good default choices and, and pre-built objects for you. So why don't we move one slide forward? So one of the other big thing that we are been working on uh, and that you should see uh, to start to come out in, in October timeframe is actually a deeper integration with G Suite. Uh, and that should take the form of really a new entry in Sheets first and eventually in G Drive, where you can actually create an app directly from whatever context you're in. Uh, and then, you know, so we'll start with the, uh, with the sheet and then we'll do it with uh, Drive. Uh, and then finally, we're also working on building a companion app on the side of your G Suite experience where you can actually enter an app sheet uh, app creation experience as well. Let's, uh, let's move forward one slide, please. So something that we announced a couple of weeks ago, for those of you who were attending on air, uh, where Amit Zaveri actually gave a keynote about the no code application and uh, the AppSheet ecosystem is, you know, and we, and the name of course of, of, the, of the service, which will be named AppSheet Automa uh, Automation. 
uh, automate, uh, is really for us to be able to, to support more robust processes and workflows. And mostly supporting things like branchings and loops and, uh, and, and not just actually automating a, a process uh, that doesn't require human intervention, but actually also uh, allow what we call human in the loop, which is mostly through approval processes and allowing you to fork your process one way or the other depending on some entries made by humans so that also means we need to be able to wait for those humans to give that feedback and to unblock the current workflows so that's why we have to wait for what we call long-running processes where you look pretty much the process is on hold until something happened an event happened which is usually triggered by human uh, so we've been working on the visual designer for that uh, that you have a screenshot to the left of it here uh, it will subsume the current workflows that we support, the current actions that we support. So everything you have in terms of existing workflows and actions will continue to work, but you will just be able to do a lot more. And particularly, you'll be able to do it much more visually and graphically than you were before. So also hopefully that will make that experience a lot more, not just pleasant, but efficient as well. And one, we... yeah, go ahead. I'm gonna un unpack uh, one piece of that a little bit, Terry. So, um, and I should also preface, we are all still working from home uh, right now. So if you hear a dog in the background, I know my dog has been quite vocal today, uh, this morning as well. Don't be surprised, just a heads up for our that audience. Just my little puppy, uh, Lola, who is 12 weeks old that you just heard. Oh, so cute. Uh, she is very cute, I should, I should say. She doesn't well. understand the concept of webinar to 400 people. That's not, <laughs> not She'll learn. Uh, so to unpack uh, and revisit something that um, Thierry just touched on. So uh, two weeks ago, we participated in what's called Next on Air um, with our Google colleagues. And we you know, discussed a lot of our relationship with Apogee and whatnot and the larger business application platform that uh, AppSheet is a part of. Uh, we do have a recording of the keynote uh, that Amit gave during that session that discusses dis, discusses excuse me the app sheet automation piece and I'll ensure to include a link uh, so you all can take a look at that and I think um, a few members of our team actually had a demo that they presented there as well it's about eight minutes long so we'll make sure that that's there so you have that as reference. Um, all right, Thierry, on to the next one. And for that, actually, I'm going to hand over to Harsh to take us through the next couple of slides. Thanks, Yuri. Um, just a quick note on the app sheet automation. Um, I know uh, we just said like uh, we are, we're all working towards um, getting it ready for early access. In fact, sometime this week, uh, we will be actually releasing it for early access for a bunch of customers to try that out. We're excited to get the feedback and iterate on it and uh, hopefully have a beta uh, before end of this year. So uh, keep, stayed, uh, keep, keep tuned for that. Um, with regards to um, yeah, Apigee is our uh, Apigee is a is a group that we work very closely with, and this is um, we're also working towards uh, exposing that um, functionality through AppSheet and and make it more available for no code um, creators. As part of that, we have a um, few uh, features that are lined up. Uh, initially, uh, you could manually um, uh, use your API keys that you use to expose the um, APIs. Uh, through our product and you know you, uh, you could actually expose um, read-only apps based on that you could also have more functional read write uh, functionality if um, you view as the location of um, your open api spec uh, that's available uh, and we could actually generate apps um, uh, based on that um, that's and we are excited about this feature because um, uh, we just did a GA launch announcement, as uh, Jennifer was saying, to, uh, in the next uh, on-air. Uh, it's generally available for users to try it out and give us feedback. Um, we would love, we would look forward to getting some um, uh, feedback from you uh, once you try it. And Harsh, I will add um, that a gentleman named Scott joined me a few about a month ago um, mm -hmm. to discuss this specific. Um, feature set, and we did a pretty extensive webinar during that time. Um, so I, I will be certain to link to that as well, because it can be a little complicated for our traditional citizen developers who aren't yes. used to working with APIs. And he does a great job of, of breaking that down so it's easier to access. Great. We are looking for, towards um, making it more easier, auto-detecting Apigee, all those nice things, but those will follow uh, in the future versions. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, yeah, of course. Right. Next slide. All right. All right. Uh, so, as part of um, 
new connectors. Uh, the, this quarter, we are looking towards, as I, as I mentioned, we already um, announced uh, Apigee connector as GA. We are working on a more functional open API spec based connector. We use that in the Apigee connector today, uh, underlying. We plan to use it more generally for um, any open API spec. You, um, you might want to uh, bring it on and generate apps out of that. Um, and then we also uh, are working, uh, we just tried out app script connector uh, with, with a few customers. Uh, we are iterating on the feature and we, we are looking forward for um, more wider release uh, end of this year. It's primarily to uh, catering to users who are heavy on app maker and how they could use their uh, existing um, uh, app maker code uh, and, and build apps on top of it using app sheet. Yeah. Hirsch, can I jump in with one um, comment? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I think many of you, if you're familiar with AppSheet, may not be as familiar with Open API and things like that. So um, it's maybe if I can spend 30 seconds to describe what I've learned about this. Um, often you have a data source, let's say um, some application um, that you're using for, you know, within your organization which doesn't have some kind of standard database that can be exposed. Um, and that's where, and often these applications may have an API. Um, open API is a sort of a standardized protocol, a way of sort of almost a stylized uh, syntax in which APIs can be built so that something like AppSheet can set up a connector to it and discover what it does. So it has a sort of standardized way of doing it. Apigee is a product that Google has that allows you to build such APIs. Um, and so you can build flexible APIs to talk to systems that are sitting behind it. In this case, when you expose such things, AppSheet can consume that data and work against that um, seamlessly as though it was in a spreadsheet or in a SQL database. So it just sort of extends the range of the systems you can connect with AppSheet. Yeah, thanks, Harsh. Thanks, Praveen, uh, for talking through that. The next set is actually something we are very passionate about. Um, we feel that the only way we could scale is through opening up our uh, container uh, connectors to uh, contributors. And towards that, we are uh, working on a standard uh, a contract for our connectors, which is you know, going to be a container. And we are trying out some early, so early connectors using containers. Uh, to name a few, and you will see them um, in hopefully in the early half of next year, is HubSpot is something we are working on, and there are a couple of other connectors um, that we are containerizing and um, exposing through AppSheet. Uh, we plan to evolve this further because we see we, we think that for us to get a wider uh, range of connectors is to have this contract and let um, partners or users contribute to it. Uh, but that's a little bit of a long-term plan. First, we want to have the standard contract going. On to the next one, as, as Thierry touched upon, we are working on AppSheet automation as part of it, you know, to power long running processes uh, that can be triggered based on some condition. All those things required us to actually, um, uh, required us to actually uh, rework the existing connectors and, uh, and um, enhance them with some uh, features like they, they are triggerable uh, we can consume the triggers. For example, in a Salesforce, every time there is a new opportunity, for those of you who are familiar with Salesforce, um, we would like to, you, you would uh, like to trigger a process. So we are enhancing our Salesforce adapter to be, um, uh, to, to be triggered, to, to um, kind of raise an events. Similarly with Google Sheets, uh, every time there's an update on a sheet, we would like a process to be triggered. Today, it's possible through app, you could actually update a sheet through an app and then that triggers the normal processes um, but this is more for um, automation itself where the processes are long running and they're running in an asynchronous fashion um, we're also working on more closer integration with g suite and um, gcp um, some of the fee uh, so for those of you you're working uh, you could i mean we are working on a firebase integration and um, gcp or all and all and also with GCP IAM, they both are very different for different set of uh, functionalities. We plan to um, expose them um, as integrations uh, sometime down the lane this year uh, for the early uh, for the early adopters. Um, 
yeah, those are the main main GCP and G Suite integrations that we are working on. We already have a chat integration and a calendar integration that we plan to build further on top of it. Um, that's where we are. To the next slide, please. With that, I'll hand it over to Thierry to talk further about the app experience. Thank so you. Actually, Thank you, Harsh. Yeah, Thierry, like before I'm that, gonna, I was going to say that yeah, questions. Yeah. Yep. Interjecting with a few questions here. So, uh, a couple relevant to this section or, or the session overall, I should say. Uh, first and foremost, foremost, Ami uh, asked or said, there are a lot of new features. Will there be video tutorials uh, made by you as you did a few years ago and feature Fridays with Santiago? Uh, I'm happy to tackle this one. <laughs> so Ami, great news. Uh, feature Fridays actually are currently taking place. I personally write those, so I, I can I can vouch for, <laughs> for those. Uh, video tu tu tutorials, excuse me. Uh, I need more coffee apparently. Uh, we are producing a number of different styles of video tutorials. Uh, one, these office hour sessions to provide an opportunity to see these happen uh, in real time. And you can certainly ask questions and we can troubleshoot with you in our traditional office hour sessions. This format just happens to be a little more formal um, than the others that we offer. So I highly recommend engaging with those. Also the creator community uh, that we mentioned at the top that's a great resource uh, to stay up to date on new feature releases, engage with the art engineering team, engage with different app creators as well who are also um, adventuring with these new features as well. So highly encourage you to check that out. Uh, Praveen, Harsh, Thierry, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, it was good, thank you. Okay. Uh, I think Santiago uh, has become a very popular video star. So I would encourage <laughs> you to hit him up with the community and tell him how he has to, you know, participate in the in the latest season of app sheet office hours <laughs> yes demand demand will bring uh, a santiago presence back i think that's a great point for me. um a couple of questions have popped up on the community thread uh, and this again is a, is a broader question regarding uh, partners uh, for those that are interested in working with AppSheet in a partner capacity. Uh, if you are currently in the Google ecosystem, please, which it sounds like a few of you are, please contact your uh, Google partner uh, rep and they can help get you set up uh, with that. And if you have any uh, questions about that, feel free to uh, ping me directly and I can certainly uh, help you with that as well. All right, uh, Thierry, those are the questions I have for now. Um, ready to talk us users? Let's talk users. I mean, don't hesitate to keep asking questions. We'll definitely make sure we, we address those as they come along, even if they are on other topics than uh, the one I'm currently presenting. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the, the users, the one, the people who actually consume the apps that you create through, uh, through the web editor. So let's move forward one slide. So we're doing a few things here. Some of those are actually rolled out already. If you don't mind moving. Yeah, here you go. Thank you. So the first thing that's already rolled out, uh, and we we talked a little bit on the community, but we actually kind of did it silently. We mostly replaced our chart library. The one we were using uh, was uh, not really to our liking in terms of the amount of flexibility and how easy or efficient it was for us to make the changes that you, you kept requesting, rightfully so, uh, for us to improve uh, or, or visi visual aspects to fix. So we, uh, but last month, we actually rolled out the new library, which should have taken care of most of the visual you know, issues that we had with the rendering aspects of the library. That's also the same chart library that we're also going to be using to do to improve the authoring experience that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, we've got mostly positive feedback on uh, on the new charts. We haven't heard of um, you know much or any issues with it. If you do find any issues with it, it doesn't render quite the way you wanted. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely please let us know on the community. Uh, and we're we're watching that. I know I'm watching that daily to to make sure that uh, that that it does the right job here. But anyway, it's already rolled out, so you should be already enjoying those. Uh, we definitely you know, part of that is you know we also notice that part of us adding more analytic capabilities to the systems that we need to give you as users uh, and to some extent to the creators as well the ability to really filter the application and today to to the data that you're visualizing through those charts and actually to any of those views and uh, not just charts. And so we are definitely gonna be focusing on actually giving that capability to both the author and the users to do some create time and after that some runtime filtering uh, dynamically of the views that, uh, that you're looking at without having to resort to building slices for it, which is kind of what you have to do today, which is 
a lot more work than you really should have to do for simple gestures such as filtering. So that's actually something we're going to be focusing on and what we hope is going to be a tremendous value to uh, to users. Uh, the other thing too that we've realized too is we've put a lot of focus and emphasis on uh, the web editor, but uh, you know we also kind of want to to do some tuning and improvement of the of visually of how the uh, application appears to your users as well. Not necessarily based on settings you put on the editor, but really just make it much you know, look more fresh, more uh, more modern. So we're going to be rolling out fairly silently actually uh, and trickling trickling those over the next few weeks, a bunch of uh, UX refreshes. And they're mostly around what font size we use by default or even what font we use by default, some padding elements, some separator elements, you know, and mostly we're gonna be playing with the gradient of grace, for example, the, the thickness of some of those lines and just trying to do some subtle changes that just make the uh, appearance of the app more pleasant and feel just more modern altogether without, of course, any changes to context or layout or you know, major layout organization of it. Uh, so this is one that uh, it's unlikely that we're going to do big videos of it uh, because they're all going to be fairly minor individually. Uh, hopefully, holistically, they're going to actually make a, a, a significant improvement in the appearance of the app. Uh, but individually, they're all going to be fairly uh, fairly minor. Uh, and then the last thing that we've been working on for a while, and I put a couple of uh, uh, posts on the community about it, was video capture. Um, and video capture is not as, as trivial because it's it's a much bigger object than just pictures. And there's definitely privacy information about, uh, you know, if we need to start, start storing some of those ourselves versus not uh, for performance reasons. So it, it's a bit more complex than just adding a new object like we do with pictures, for example. So I think the current prototype that we have built is mostly limiting at 10 seconds, uh, but we're, we're looking at very different ways of, of putting some limitation that, that will allow the performance of synchronization to still be very decent, decent while also you know, keeping the, the the scenario very valuable uh, to you. Uh, anything you want to add, Praveen, particularly to any of the topics I just mentioned here, since I know you're very involved in all of those. Uh, no, for all of these, I think the uh, the investments you're making in charting it's an area we have not um, invested anywhere near enough over the years. So that hopefully will make uh, would be very valuable, and that will come in, you know, like Terry, just like you said, lots of lots of little things. But collectively, if we look at it a few months from now, charting will be significantly better than it is right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Terry, I have a question um, from the community that I wanted to raise. This is perfect timing in relation to video capture. Um, so the question is about an audio player with an app sheet. Uh, at the moment, um, you can natively play video files. However, it still does not support audio files. How does this look on the roadmap uh, as there is a huge demand for this feature? Yeah, I mean, I, I suspect that's one of those things we will look probably immediately after the video. You know, video and audio have similar type of, uh, of challenges, although I would say video has more GDPR type of problems or compliance problems and PI information problem than than audio, but even audio to some extent, the tone of your voice is something that is considered PII as well. The same way faces are that are part of the of the image captured. So uh, and the volume, uh, although not as significant as video, is still bigger potentially than some of those uh, photos as well. So my suspicion is, as soon as we figure out the right solution, the right mix, uh, uh, the right architecture that will give us the mix of enough benefit in terms of the size and length of the videos we can capture with also how we can store it efficiently for synchronization performance uh, without impacting the compliance aspect of it or the privacy aspect of it. Once we find the right uh, architecture and the right design for the video, uh, then doing it for the for the audio it should be a fairly natural follow up to it. Uh, so again, without you know having a, a good idea at that point about timeline around it, I, I suspect the trailblazing we're gonna do for the video is you're gonna be fully uh, reusable for the, for the, for the audio. Uh, would you agree with that, Praveen? I think the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the question was about audio playback, as in we have video playback right now. We have a video column type. Um, we don't have an audio column type. Um, oh, okay. Me so it would be pretty easy to add an audio column type that uh, just does playback of audio. Um, it hasn't been, uh, at least our perception is it hasn't been something that a lot of people have uh, demanded but it's just our perception and we could be wrong on that so 
this would be something for us just find out in the community over the next few days. If it turns out a lot of folks really want audio, I mean, by itself, it's about a couple of months of work for one person to do. So it's not uh, humongous, it's doable. It just has to be fitted in with everything else. Yeah. Cool. Thank you both. Uh, all right, Thierry, are you to proceed to the next one? Yes. So if we've covered all the questions for that section, let's uh, yes. let's move on to the to the third and last uh, scenario, not scenario, but user persona, which is really the managed uh, experience, and that's mostly for the the uh, account owner who in some cases only manages one, a, a few uh, users and one, applica one, one application, but in some, for some of our customers, for some of you, where you have dozens, if not hundreds of application created and definitely thousands of users. And so you ha we, we have to make sure that we give, make it easier for you to manage uh, with compliance, all of those applications. And again, without necessarily having to resort to any sort of coding or scripting. So we uh, want to make a lot of investment here. So why don't you move forward with one slide and uh, the first thing I want to talk about here is governance and policies. And we definitely have ways to do policies and custom policies today. Not necessarily the most trivial thing we realize that. And so we're definitely taking a big look at revamping the overall policy definition experience so that it's a lot more uh, obvious how to set up custom policies uh, because while you can use those, you can create custom policies with expression today, you can have to understand somewhat the schema of the objects, how we store them in order to actually be able to do it. And we just really want to go towards declarative policy definition, where you will again describe using words uh, how you want, what you want your policy to do, and we will help you set it up right uh, from the get go. So it's going to take us a, a bit of a while to get there, but what we're working on right now is kind of revamping the overall architecture of our policy settings and allow you to doing so uh, some some uh, some more uh, policy settings using expression in an easier way than it is today. Again, going towards what we call declarative policy definitions. The other thing that I want to talk about here a little bit is uh, part of the whole new chart library that we're going to be exposing uh, in Q4 for uh, authoring and not just rendering. We also want to take advantage of that to actually significantly increase the amount of compliance and, and, and user genetics uh, reports that we give and we make available to you compared to what we have today. Now, part of that is a bit of, uh, of infrastructure work. We have to actually uh, also evolve our infrastructure about how we track usage information, how we track the events, and kind of the, the, the entire eventing model of, 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 of you know, how we how we log all of that information from, from usage uh, and, and expose that. And we can also have to go through some of those uh, migration uh, to the Google technology uh, and leverage some of the, uh, the Google technology to do that too. So, uh, so there's a bunch of infrastructure work here, but the, the value for you as an admin administrator of the system is you should have an easier time setting policies by the end of the year and hopefully a much much easier time and much more efficient ways to do it uh, sometime next year uh, why don't we move forward one slide here um, so here the uh, there's there's all the things that we're going to be doing here um, we're going to be integrating with uh, with google and google groups in particular organizational units flex, flex, flexible orgs uh, and that's what we're going to do first. And then we're going to follow up with others like AWS Cognito, for example. Uh, but we want to be able to make it easier for you to, uh, through those integration tools, to be able to define multiple teams within a domain, which I know has been something that's been very heavily uh, requested. And also being able to have you know, multiple administrators on the system, uh, being able to establish team policies, team resources, being able to scope specific admin information, so give you a much a uh, greater and richer way to, to have uh, a set of people uh, involved in managing teams and not just in single domain uh, as it is today. So, and a lot of that is gonna start with first integrating with you know, Google Directory, AWS Cognitos, uh, and then offering you those, uh, those additional capabilities uh, here as well. Uh, anything you wanna add to what I just said, Praveen? Because I know you're very involved with some of those designs as well. Uh... Not really. If there's questions, we'd be, you know, definitely we can talk more about it. Um, yeah, we're just sort of trying to have some consistent uh, approaches to managing all the applications you build, even just in one account, um, and scaling the same mechanisms to work across all the accounts in one organization or company or team. Yeah. 
So why don't we, we have a couple more slides talking about the overall you know, infrastructure and administration, and then of course we'll, we'll pause and take all of the questions that might come up. So why don't we move forward one slide please, uh, Jennifer, and then I will let transition this uh, for the next couple of slides to Harsh. Thanks, Siri. So over the last few months, uh, the team has been busy, mostly Google acquisition, to um, migrate most of the infrastructure onto, uh, from Azure to Google. Um, so I'm glad to say that our, for the last few weeks, we are uh, running on Google, and um, some of you uh, have also noticed um, some improved uh, performance uh, due to that. Um, so as part of this, sorry. That's our data center, right, Harsh? That's our data center. Uh, that bike belongs to you, correct? <laughs> yes, How I literally went work. there and took the servers from Azure and planted there. Okay. All right, jokes about, but um, so uh, we we managed to migrate um, most of the services, and there was um, there was some community uh, outreach also to uh, see some of the um, some of the downtimes for app creators, specifically not for the live apps that uh, you might have noticed. Um, I'm glad to say that we are done with the migration. Uh, as part of this, we also took the opportunity to um, kind of enable the platform or the infrastructure uh, to get to make use of Google services, right? For example, uh, if there is a need to um, enable new regions, we are ready to do that. Uh, do that in a matter of minutes, uh, and also, you know, almost without no downtime and seamlessly for the customers. Uh, this is primarily for the latency and um, latency reasons to give you high uh, performance. Um, as part of it, we have, we have introduced Sydney and Singapore as additional regions. Regions. Uh, we kind of paused on turning back, uh, turning them back on, but we plan to do it uh, pretty soon in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, this we think, like for all the users, um, for all of you who are uh, who have your apps running from those regions, uh, they should see some improved performance on top of it uh, for the, for those apps. Um, we're also working on a slightly larger plan, which is uh, to, this is more catering to some of our enterprise customers who are more regulated and who have more stricter needs around where the data resides and, uh, uh, and you know, the performance guarantees they would like to do, they would like to provide to their end users. We are looking at a tenant per customer sort of a model, uh, but those, that's more in the horizon of H1 to H2 2021, right? That's when we plan to, give users uh, in a ability in a self-serviceable way, way to choose the region they would like their apps to run and enable uh, and also hopefully the data location of their um, of the apps if any uh, along with that so Harsh, that's what you, sorry good so sorry you good. mentioned two new regions had been added uh, can you give a quick list of where all of the regions are currently sure absolutely um sorry that messed off um, my mind uh, we are currently live in U.S. Central, U.S. East, U.S. West, EU West, um, uh, Sydney, and Singapore. So these are the regions that we are currently live on. And if there are, if there is any request for adding more regions, we would be happy to um, uh, entertain those. We we also have caches in these regions. That means you know the the, the most access data gets cached um, for each of these regions and it gets served from there. So we reduce the cross-region latency that way. Awesome, thank you for that. Yeah, if I can jump in with a comment for people who have been with AppSheet for a while. Um, when you start building something, a service like this, you typically don't design it initially for this kind of scale. So you start out by focusing on what features people need and then it incrementally grows. Um, and some of you may know that about a year ago, this service, even a month ago, the service was still running on um, Microsoft Azure, which is Microsoft's cloud hosting infrastructure. We moved it over to uh, Google Cloud. Um, so this is sort of a continuous process of um, scaling the infrastructure. At this point, there are, um, in each of these data centers, many servers that will, in a sort of elastic way, scale, uh, spin up, or spin down depending on load, uh, depending on how many people are syncing or doing updates at the same time. And so it's come a long way in terms, so Harsh makes it sound easy, oh, we just put, set up some data centers, but uh, moving the service um, from Azure over without, um, without uh, stopping the apps from running uh, was actually pretty non-trivial um, to do because you're trying to move, live migrate the system. 
and that's why it took a few weekends to do that right but um most of it is now running in these new data centers quite a, a, a it's it's quite impressive to me having worked with these different cloud infrastructures over time to see how seamless this has been great thanks Ravin, for the nice words it's usually tough to get those out from Praveen. um <laughs> Towards those, we are also instrumenting the product, uh, as Thierry has touched upon before, um, we are instrumenting the product to actually um, start uh, recording the uh, recording the times uh, it took to process and stuff better. That way, we could um, potentially looking at um, uh, catering a committed SLA to some of the customers who, who have asked for it. Um, so we would be looking at uh, so. We already have the information. This is more about what information we would surface. What's the uh, kind of wrapping around the definition of an SLA, and um, you know, uh, putting it out there for most uh, rest of you to take a look at it, and how we are doing per customer or across the board. So this is this is going to be that sort of information that we're going to put it out there. Um, on to the next slide, please. Compliance. So we are already SOC two. Type two compliant as of 20, for 2020 on Azure. Um, we made sure we, the team took high care on when we were porting on the GCP that we maintain the same standards uh, to meet the SOC 2 um, audit uh, and compliance requirements. So we are very hopeful that we will have a, a audit on GCP 2 very soon. Um, we're also working on HIPAA and BA compliance for the uh, to and targeting them uh, before end of this year. Um, as part of it, like we are also, uh, and, um, we are also making sure, like we're um, we're doing client side encryp encryption for editors and drive. Um, you could also this will also allow customers to, you know, encrypt drives, docs, sheets, and slides uh, prior to saving them uh, with your cloud keys. Uh, hopefully, in sometime in 2021, with your own keys, or hopefully in some sometime in 2021, we call them as customer managed encryption key support. Um, that's what. We plan to work in 2021. Um, apart from that, we're also going. Uh, the team is busy working on FedRAMP. Uh, this is this is what the business um, sees as a key requirement from a lot of our um, uh, financial and highly regulated uh, customers. Um, we are shooting for a FedRAMP certification along with ISO. We, we are running parallel in for both of them uh, by early 2021 or first half of 2021. Um, uh, the team is busy in identifying the gaps and um, you know meeting those because all these are very process heavy and also require some product changes. So that's what we are targeting. Uh, we are busy with for the rest of this quarter. And gentlemen, an open question for the group. For our non-technical citizen developers who are looking at this and saying that's a bunch of letters and numbers and I don't understand what this means, uh, can you explain why these compliance um, line items are important or how they might impact their businesses. Yeah, so let me take that. Um, here's what generally happens in a company. You know, uh, if you're working in a small business, much of this is probably not relevant to you. But let's say you're working at a larger company and you're just somebody working one of the, you know, you're just a person working in sales or marketing anywhere, right? And you find app sheet, you start building your app against it. Great, your team likes it, your managers like it, your team starts using the product. Um, what happens typically is when that thing succeeds and more people want to use it, at some point your IT department gets involved. And the IT department says, hey, that sounds good, but has it, is it certified? And if it's not certif certified, it's just there's an auditors who come and you know, vet that your system is being built in a secure fashion, it's respecting privacy and so on, and make sure that we have good processes on our side to do the engineering right, that we do background checks on people, et cetera. There's a whole lot of process that they audit and verify that we are operating in a respectable fashion. And the IT department wants to know this because they're, they're like, look, you're running something important on this. Um, where's our guarantee that this is a you know, reputable product certification and so on. So it's gonna matter when the apps you build uh, become successful. Awesome, thank you for that, Praveen. Uh, Harsh, did you have anything else you wanted to add for the compliance piece? No, actually, that's pretty much it. Um, uh, 
we can talk about what all we covered in the next uh, in the next slide. I think that's a summary. I'll let Thierry go over it. Yeah, so the, exactly. The next slide is mostly a summary of uh, what we presented over the last uh, 40, 45 minutes. Uh, and we'll see using that as kind of a wrap up slide and inviting uh, your questions on any of those topics uh, or any others actually that uh, that you want to leverage uh, some face time with Praveen, Harsh, and myself uh, to ask. Yeah. All right. Well, I've got a couple questions uh, for you, gentlemen. So, first question uh, it's from Zachary. Question is, does this mean that AppSheet can use VPC peering with other GCP users? Great question, Zachary. Um, that's the intent when we move towards a tenant per customer, because it's usually VPC peering is um, um, it's, it's easier to configure, or you can use the same turnkey VPC uh, settings um, uh, within a project if you're aware, if you're aware of uh, GCP today. So that's that's what we're working towards um, next year. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, uh, just for the other people who are probably lost. Um, uh, so usually in, uh, in the cloud, a customer may have what's called their own tenant, which is just their set of hosted machines and services that are protected because they stay within their own network, right? And nobody else can access them. And so the question is really now, can we allow AppSheet to access some of these resources, let's say a database in one of these tenants in a secure fashion? In other words, um, AppSheet's allowed to participate in this network without opening it up to everybody else. And um, that's sort of the intent, sort of matters for the enterprise sort of users. Um, and we may be able to do that if we if we um, evolve our architecture to some extent, as uh, I was talking about. Awesome. All right. Anything else to add on that particular question? Are you ready for the next one? I'm going to take that as a let's proceed. Uh, I'm new to AppSheet. Yes. Are there any banks using AppSheet right now? I believe so. Uh, don't know that we're allowed to talk about explicitly who and so on, but um, um, especially in the last um, in the last nine months that we've been part of Google, I think there's been you know, quite a bit of interest in the uh, um, banking sector. Um, yeah, banking, telecom is another sector that has been uh, yeah. interest. Yeah, a lot of telecom. Uh, okay, so there's a, a question here about which features will be included in Pro. Um, we have on our website right now on AppSheet.com, there is a list of features that are included in AppSheet Pro. Um, that's today, that's accurate, that may change in the future, um, but as of right now, that is our current Pro offering. Uh, Thierry, Praveen, Harsh, did you have anything else you wanted to add on plan type? Um, I mean, I can talk to the principles. Our yeah. general principle is that all features used to build uh, the app are actually available in the free version and they're available in the pro version for the apps that you're going to go deploy. Almost all features we want to make available um, so that you can build the app with all of its behaviors, right? Um, and generally speaking, the things that we put into the more the business plans um, that are higher than the pro plan tend to be about scale, about manageability, about connecting to enterprise data sources. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of thing we put into the business plans. That's the sort of the, the broad um, principles that we've followed so far, and uh, we expect to continue to follow them. All right. Um, so next question that I have is about AppSheet automation. Um, and this is a little little broader. I'd like to see more about AppSheet automations. I watched the demo from Cloud Next, and I think I get what it's basically about, but some more detail and use cases would be helpful to get a bigger picture. There's a lot to unpack there. Uh, who would like to, to take a first, first pass at it? Well, so the, the first thing I think that we, uh, that we, probably should plan on doing is actually dedicate uh, one of the upcoming office hours entirely on Automate uh, as we get closer to the preview. Because as you were saying, it's, it's going to be a very, very rich new set of capabilities to the product that we cannot do justice in five minutes, uh, just as part of another presentation. But I think that we should dedicate. So 
uh, you know, it's, 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 yeah, it's probably one of those things that Jennifer, we should just plan to have one of the sessions in October or November, just to be fully dedicated on that. Yeah, it's basically it's still early days on uh, on it, so you'll see a lot more of uh, coming out. Um, we're trying to generalize what we did before with, we've done so far with workflow rules. I'm trying to generalize it and make it much uh, more flexible, more power, powerful as sort of a process automation system. So. And just to add to, there was a, a question specifically around use cases. Um, so. Uh, yeah. You Sorry, go, go ahead, Jen. No, no, Praveen, all yours. Yeah, there's two broad use cases that go beyond what we've already do with workflow rules. Workflow rules today, um, there's two things we do. When changes happen inside a mobile, inside an app built an app sheet, uh, to react to that, we have change-driven rules, which typically do things like send an email to somebody. Um, we also have scheduled rules, which run on a schedule and that they do stuff, typically to generate reports. Um, there's two new things that uh, were enabled, scenarios, if you wish. One is a scenario that reacts to change in systems and then tries to do human-driven uh, processes like approvals. An example would be a change happens in a Salesforce instance, a new order is created, and then you need to get humans to approve um, um, the order. And that approval may happen through an app sheet app or through some other mechanism. So that's one example, one class of scenarios. The other class of scenarios is system to system integration. So when a change happens in Salesforce, make sure it's updated to HubSpot or to Google Sheet or to database. Um, and so uh, that's a different kind of scenario. And uh, we want to enable these with rich logic for the process, or process flow itself. Awesome, thanks Praveen. Uh, all right, so uh, next question is about Fire, Firebase. Uh, Firebase Identity, GCP, hold on, sorry, Koichi, I'm trying to, to decode your question here. Uh, does it simply mean we will have Firebase connectors, meaning the app will be refreshed automatically once the backend data is edited by someone else? Is it a real-time database? A good, good question. Um, I would like to say we, the first iteration will be you could you could uh, integrate with your Firebase account or a GCP IAM service account, um, and it should be able to pull in all the roles and permissions you've set up, things like that, or all the entities you have enabled with that account. But we do plan to we do plan to build further on top of it. Um, so still early days. There is a there's going to be a version one, and uh, we'll add more capabilities of automatically refreshing the data, refreshing the data once there are updates uh, in your Firebase uh, account or GCP, vice versa. Ravi, yeah. anything you want to add? Yeah, with, uh, Koichi, you're just sort of, uh, two steps ahead of us on this. Um, <laughs> I, the first card is we're going to try to make sure that the same identity providers, um, the notion of identity, who's the person signing in, um, that we can align that. So as you know, we have various identity provider support today, but we don't have it for the Firebase identity. Um, the broader thing is we want to see if there can be Firebase is a set of services that lets developers build typically infrastructure that helps mobile apps, typically. And um, so if you had a team of business users, app sheet creators, as well as developers who are familiar with Firebase, how do they work well effectively together so that app sheet people can leverage and utilize some of the assets built with Firebase? That's the direction we want to get to. Um, but most of that work will happen, I think, in 2021, not this year. Okay. And that's where all the real-time database and all that stuff hopefully will come in. And uh, speaking of databases, and, and Praveen, I think this is just an extension of what you addressed. Um, the question is, do you plan to add any native uh, database hosting so you don't always have to connect to an external data source? Um, I mean, I think that's, that's a sort of a perennial uh, that's a perennial topic that comes up. Um, at the moment, there's nothing new on this front in that um, there's so many different data sources that uh, Google and Google Cloud and Google broadly already support. Um, so first thing we're doing is making sure we integrate with them 
and with the common data sources that our customers have. If they're not in Google, that's fine. We want to integrate with those. Um, and it's just learning on this question of, is there a benefit to us having our own store? There's some performance benefits, um, but yeah, we often find our customers already have their data someplace. So that's just the balance we've seen before and um, nothing new on this front. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, this question comes from Zachary. There was discussion regarding the caching of pass-through data in multiple regions. Does this suggest all customer cache data is held in the same location? If so, is there a plan to segregate that data for further security in the future? I'll take a stab at it and then Praveen can um, uh, add more color to it. So we, we try not to store any customer data. As, as much as possible. So as a, as a platform, uh, we are um, uh, we are more of a client to the underlying customer data sources. Having said that, we do we do cache the data on mobile devices and um, also in the regional caches to to po provide more performant apps for our customers. So this cache is the data in the cache is short lived and uh, it gets uh, flushed out depending on the access patterns um so but this but but we have all our apps definitions and everything uh, sitting in our central uh, database and that's what gets accessed every time there is a you know there is some sort of a data update or a read uh, that happens from an app uh, so it, so that's the that's the latency we're trying to optimize also by storing uh, those app templates and everything uh, in the regional caches hopefully that explained praveen you would like to add more yeah, think of the data involved in app sheet as two categories. One is what the app creator defines, the definition and you know information about the users, that sort of thing. That stuff sits in our, we have a central database with. Yeah. Um, and then think when you're running the app itself, you are, the app has to talk to your data sources. That's the, live, the data that the app uses. That's what your users see, the data they capture and so on. The data that the app, the users use and that the app sees, that second category, is never stored in our databases, right? Because we don't need it, we pass through on that. Um, and that data should largely only flow from the devices people are running on through the servers we have, which um, uh, live in the region that those users are, to the data sources that you configure. It could be your Google Drive, a database, whatever it is. So that's the flow of those. And that data doesn't get cached either. There's a couple of exceptions where you know somebody chooses a specific option, but the data that's being cached is things that would live normally in our central database, but are being cached locally for efficiency. That makes sense. So uh, we try not to hold on to um, or keep copies of um, the data that your users are actually using. Gotcha. All right. Uh, so I think that's a good place to end it. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to join us did you have any closing thoughts or words you'd like to share with the audience before we we exit yeah the one thing first of all you know thank you for everybody who attended here and uh you know definitely we look forward to giving you the next updates so about a quarter from now but uh also i want to encourage everybody again to stay engaged or to engage with us through the community uh, we're trying to be as responsive as we can i know uh, praveen myself harsh uh, and many on the teams we're in there every day that doesn't mean we get to see everything because there's tons of conversation, but, uh, but you know, you can definitely always tag us uh, and uh, we definitely try to stay engaged in understanding what challenges you have, uh, what feedback you have on features that we've shortly released. Uh, so definitely, definitely uh, encourage you, uh, you all to be as active as, uh, as you can be on the community and to make it vibrant and help each other and, uh, and engage us when, uh, when we need, uh, need our, our input or, or feedback on, on specific uh, feedback that you have for us. Uh, Praveen or Harsh, anything you'd like to, to close out with? No, oh, thank you for the opportunity and looking forward to talk to you in about a quarter uh, with more updates. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to say thank you, Jen. You're the, you're the star of the current season of Office Hours. Oh, well, I, I don't know about a star, but thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, folks, thank you again for joining us this morning. Uh, this recording, a recording of this will be posted uh, both on our YouTube channel and within the community for future reference. Um, Thierry, should we post the deck for this as well or a version of it um, for the audience or just the recording? 
I mean, the recording will include the, the, the slides in there. So I know the recording is just fine. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So you folks will have access to a recording of this. Uh, stay safe. Stay healthy, everyone. Um, and as always, please reach out to us if you need anything at all AppSheet related, and we'll do what we can for you. All right. On that note, have a wonderful rest of your day, and we'll see you on the community.